Hello and uh, welcome to our 17th episode of the Fight Fit Podcast. Uh, I've got uh, the lovely Christopher Cronus here with us today to have a chat about uh, all things combat sports from when he was involved in it. Hi, Bash. Uh, how are you? Very well, mate. How are you? Fantastic. Thanks for coming on to the show. Uh, you're very welcome. Mate, so talk to us. Tell us about uh, how you got into the fighting industry. Well, that's a great question. Okay, where do I begin? Um, well, I got uh, I got involved with martial arts uh, at the ripe old age of about uh, fourteen or fifteen, I think. Yep. Uh, with uh, Bob Jones, uh, Zen Dukai. Yep. And um, what year was that? Oh my God, I'm fifty-seven now, so we're talking uh, forty-three years ago. Awesome. <laughs> yep. So what? We're two thousand nineteen. Uh, so we would take another oh, twenty-four 19. years. Or, so about nineteen seventy-six. Beautiful. Mm. Yep. About nineteen seventy-six. So that was uh, the early days when um, I used to. Uh, Go to the Melbourne Town Hall and watch uh, George Zachariah, yep. uh, you know, in his all his glory. Yep. Uh, do some fantastic fighting bouts against some of the Kung Fu guys, which was great. Yep. And uh, watch the team team events and uh, yep. all the, you know, the semi-contact point events. Yep. Which eventually uh, evolved to uh, to a form of kickboxing. Yep. Um, that Bob used to uh, promote uh, yep. on a fairly regular basis. And uh, I suppose being in the audience as a young guy and um, and watching it evolve, and I eventually got to start teaching martial arts and karate. And um, I noticed that a lot of the boys that I was training were really interested in um, the sports side, which was the kickboxing side or, yep. or the, you know, the fighting side. And uh, the interest developed there. And I, I, uh, I uh, you know, spoke with Bob on many occasions, and uh, I asked if you know if he wouldn't mind that I sort of went off and promoted on behalf of the club. Yep. And he gave me his blessing and his support, which was great. Yep. And um, <clears throat> we didn't have a very big pool of fighters back then. I did it primarily because I had some friends uh, that, that were interested in fighting, and um, yep, and uh, and I wanted to promote them uh, yep. and, and push them a little bit and sort of help them with their careers in, in in the sport. Yep. So I suppose it started when I was about twenty-one or so, and uh, I started promoting with a couple of. Uh, my good buddies, Con Brasalis and Con Andrianopoulos. Yep. Uh, Con Andrianopoulos, who was my instructor at the time yep. uh, in, in, in martial arts. Uh, and we got together and we formed Yakuza Promotions. Yep. <laughs> and um, and our first show, I think, was, um, if I remember correctly, I think our first show was at the Palladium in South Melbourne. Okay. Yep. I think, yeah, yeah. So how many people fit uh, into that venue? Oh, I think we had about, it was a sellout. It was about yep. eight, eight, 800 or so people. <laughs> And uh, we, uh, Tony Ducasio was the headlining uh, fighter. <laughs> he would have loved that. <laughs> oh, yeah, he loved it. Especially with his hair back in the day. And as I said to Tony, he wasn't, uh, you know, he, as a headlining fighter, he wasn't judged on skill. He was just on who can sell tickets and uh, <laughs> and who was the best looking. <laughs> 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 and Tony fit the bill on both parts. So he was always a great, a great ticket salesman. And let me tell you, he was the best looking kickboxer out there. <laughs> And better, he evolved better to be than really Tarsus as well. Definitely better looking than Tarsus. Oh well, just <laughs> just a small percentage. <laughs> Tarsus was all brawn, whereas uh, Tony was all uh, all uh, good looks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but Tony became a really really good fighter. You know, he's uh, yep. Uh, he he really was a pioneer in the sport. Yep. Uh, like so many others were at that time. But yeah, so it started back then. Yep. So who were the main guys that you were promoting? Uh, Tony Tokasia was probably my main event guy at that time. Uh, yep. Tosca, who yep. is also a very good buddy of mine and my son's uh, godfather. Yep. Uh, can, you uh, can you understand what Tosca says half the time? Yeah, no, look. <laughs> it's the best. You know, uh, being with knowing Tosca for so long, I understand every word he says. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an art, but no, he's good. Yes. Uh, uh, he's a lovely guy. He's, uh, he's a great friend. And, he's, uh, yeah. yeah he's, he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman, yeah. And he's done a lot for the sport too, you know. Absolutely. So Tosca, uh, 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 Tony Tocasio, Stan the Man, yep. uh, Longanides, uh, he, he was one of the guys that we, we helped promote and yep. push his career along. Um, who else? There was quite a few other boys that, uh, wow, I'm really testing my memory now. They were supposed to be three main guys yep. uh, uh, that I had. Yep. But I, I, I think I played a part in promoting some other boys as well that, yep. that, that came across that I really didn't look after on a full-time basis, yep. but um, but fought on my shows on a fairly regular basis as well. Yep. Uh, Alistair Gibb, uh, Mick Marshall, yep. uh, Frank Lanciana, yep. um, Joe Lanciana, yep. um, Percy, uh, Percy fought for me a couple of times. Yep. Um, 
and he was one of the uh, was one of the very early pioneers and he really uh yep. he Percy was really promoted a lot by 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 Bob yep. uh, as a headlining fighter and he was I suppose uh, 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 Zendikai's prime fighters. Yep. So was Paul, Paul Feifold. He, um, yep. I remember before I got into the fight game, before I got into the promotion game, I remember uh, when Paul fought, um, I think the guy's name was Costello from America. Yep. Um, and he completely beat up this Costello character. <laughs> he he yeah. completely beat him up. I remember Paul being interviewed by World of Sport the following day and he had this smile from ear to ear and uh, – and uh, Costello was all smashed up. He had black eyes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the commentator went over to Paul and he said, oh, Paul, that was a pretty gruesome fight. He said, no, it wasn't. He said, oh, I had a great time. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, so uh, uh, Angie Gooses was also one of my fighters back then. Yep. Um, uh, oh, we had a lot of boys. Yeah. A lot of boys. Who did you find the most difficult to match up fights for and uh, why? Um, oh, sorry, another guy that was actually a great fighter and uh, my soul rest his piece is Darren Hitchcock. Uh, yep. Yeah, he was one of my, my one of my main guys as well. He, yep. great boy, great man, and uh, one of the great fighters as well. Yep. One of the boys that I had difficulty matching. Um, that's a great question. Tosca was always difficult to match yep. because not too many guys wanted to jump in the ring with him. Yep. Because uh, he was such a tenacious fighter. Yep. And um, you know, never never gave up, and uh, you know, he's his skill level improved with time. Uh, his aggressiveness and, and and ability to really wear down his opponents yep. uh, was his, I suppose, his biggest trait. Yep. And, and and a lot of fighters didn't like that. A lot yep. of his opponents didn't like that. So um, eventually, I had to reach out overseas to try to get him most of his opponents because uh, no one locally really wanted to fight Tosca. Yeah, understandably. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mm -hmm. believe you brought Iran Barkley out here to fight uh, yes. Tosca. Yes, I think there's, there's a funny story Paul was telling me. About the flight over. Oh yeah, I I remember uh, going to the airport to pick him up in a limousine. Yep. And uh, actually, I'll tell you a funny story before that happened. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember negotiating because I negotiated with Iron Barkley directly. Yeah. And um, and he was a bit of a funny guy, and I remember calling him, and uh, when he agreed to the um, to the uh, uh, to the fight conditions, I said to him, "Look, I'll be sending over your um, your itinerary very very soon," and yep. you know. And he says, thank you. You just send me the artillery and I'll be there. <laughs> and I said, okay, artillery. I said, I'm not sending you any guns. <laughs> but anyway, when he, when, he, when he flew over and um, I was waiting for him at the airport, I was with uh, one of my uh, managers, Carl Backash, waiting for him. And uh, as he, he walked out of the, uh, uh, out of the uh, obviously, um, where, whatever it's called, where, where he's cleared customs, yep. and he's got both his belts hanging from each shoulder and Carl turned around to me and said, do you think that's Oran Barkley? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's him. <laughs> so we picked him up and uh, took him to the hotel and, uh, and uh, I remember sitting in the car with him and um, he was telling about his, uh, he was telling us about his fight history and, yep. and he told us that his family, but you know, all, all the members of his family uh, fought and he yep. said, yeah, he said, my sister fight. He said, he said, my sister fights and he said, uh, she can really bang. And Carl and, I just looked, <laughs> Carl and I just looked at each other and we said, oh, that's great. <laughs> I said, oh, she can really bang. But anyway, look, uh, he, he was a great opponent for Tosca. Yep. Um, there's actually one other funny story that was there where uh, he, um, uh, he uh, we had him sparring uh, a few different guys and we had to get him um, a, a clearance from the martial arts control board there. Yep. And they went through a, a very basic test and he didn't really pass that test with flying colors so yep. uh, the martial arts control board decided to come and watch him spar yep and uh, he sparred like three opponents and he knocked the three of them out cold <laughs> <laughs> so so the martial arts control board said okay look he's, he's, he's okay to fight so so he fought but uh yeah but tosca did a great job that night that was a a pure boxing fight and yep. uh, that really um started launched tosca's boxing career yep mm -hmm. How, what do you think got tosca over the line in that fight um i, I think he listened to paul for the first time <laughs> 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 yeah, he, he 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 took a step back and he and he fought from a distance yep uh tosca had this had this unfortunate sort of habit of crowding his opponent and yep. smothering him and never gave himself an opportunity to 
to display the skills that he actually has, you yep. know. And um, because I think at the start of Tusker's career, he 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 really capitalized on the fact that he wore down his opponents physically, yep. and he was really aggressive with them. But when he actually took that step back and boxed and actually boxed from a distance, yep. he really outpointed Iron Barkley, I think, two to one, and, and he, he hurt him. He actually, hurt him. I think, he nearly stopped him at one stage. Oh, really? Okay. So I think that's what that, I think that's what really uh, was a big change in Tosca. Yeah, mm -hmm. I heard that uh, Tosca had the opportunity to go to the states and train over there, and he did on a couple of occasions. Um, but Tosca's a very loyal man. Yes, uh, and and I admire him for that. Yes, and he would not leave Paul's side. Uh, yes. Paul's his trainer, and for him, it's Paul or nobody. Uh, yep. And I respected that. And yep. uh, and you know that's a choice that Tosca wanted to make, and that was. Yep. So we did whatever we could for him here. Yes. You know, so uh, so bring bring the mountain to Mahabad because he wouldn't go to the ma mountain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, so yeah. Yeah. Mm. I remember Paul was mentioning once. Um, you organised uh, Channel Ten to come and interview Tarsus, and uh, you'd organised it in the next vault. Where in, in the underworld, where, right? And you mentioned that um, he didn't just didn't turn up to the to the to the interview. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell us that? Tell us what happened there. Yeah, look, uh, Tosca. Yeah, Tosca's not one that's into marketing <laughs> or self marketing. Yeah, uh, Tosca lets his fists do the marketing <laughs> and his legs. Yeah. So he was. He, look, he's not a camera. He's not a guy that you know wants to get in front of the camera. Um, he learned a little bit more about. Uh, he saw, I think he, he realized the importance of that more so as his career, uh, you know, continued. But um, he, he really didn't care too much about that. So yep. he relied more on his promoter or, <coughs> excuse me, yep, or you know the the quality of his fights speak for themselves to bring people to to watch him fight. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So of all, how many shows did you end up promoting? Oh my god, I think I promoted for over ten years. Yep. Um, wow, that's a great question. I think it was doing an average of three or four a year, so it would have been at least forty shows. Yeah, Man, that's mm. that. how like I mean, we do I do the challenge here, and that's mm. that's a lot of work. But mm. I, it, it's it's relatively simpler mm. than what you'd have to do. I mean, mm. to try to find you know opponents, match them appropriately, and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Like, what, what, how did you, you yeah. know, find that whole process? Yeah, well, see, I, I was a matchmaker, and, yeah. and uh, and obviously put the whole thing together. I had people obviously that worked with me and, and assisted me with that pro uh, process, but it was difficult. Yep. It was difficult. I had a business, a fashion business to run on the side at, at the same time. And the fact was that I, I, I invested a ton of money in it. Uh, yeah. And But I saw the business opportunity with uh, with the sport. Cable TV was, you know, becoming a, 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 a quite not an option, but it was going to happen in Australia. Yes. And uh, and I stuck to it as much as I could because when I when I did the Alexia show, Alexia show with, uh, with Stan mm. and we had a great card that night, we sold out completely. We had eight thousand people in the venue. Eight thousand. Yeah, yeah. And it was it's a full house, yeah. which is great. Yeah. And uh, and then we had to, we did a live feed to the Metro nightclub. Yep. yep. And we had two thousand people there. So if we had cable TV back then, yep. you know, we probably would have become a multimillionaire overnight. Yep. And with selling that show for probably thirty or forty dollars, which was not a lot of money. Yep. I think the cheapest seats in the house were about forty or fifty dollars then. Yep. So <clears throat> we made a lot of money that night. Yep. But it could have been a lot more. Yeah. Uh, we paid the fight as well. And, and um, Dennis Alexia wasn't very happy because we also won a $100,000 side bet on his fight, <laughs> which was great, <laughs> against Bob Paul. <laughs> Couldn't happen to a nicer man. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so uh, that, was a, that was a really good experience. But, uh, you know, uh, the, so, so I think out of the 40 shows, I think I made money on three and lost on 37. Really? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I was chatting to Paul before, and he mentioned. Um, I think your brother said, uh, "Can you please stop Chris from promoting? Because every time <laughs> he promotes, the other business doesn't do that well because he focuses so much attention and time yeah. on the." It on takes the a lot of time. Yeah, as you know, you you do it yourself. But from my perspective, it was you know marketing it, you know mm -hmm. you know selling the tickets, obviously coordinating with the venue. Yep. All, all the you know infrastructure stuff that you got to, all the stuff that you got to, all the logistical stuff. Yep. You know. You know, handling the fights, that was a big job in itself. It's like handling uh, little babies, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> they're all, they're all got to be, all body be looked after and, you know. Yep. And, uh, you know, getting the right opponents for Because I, I always tried to match make as close as possible as we could. Yep. Nobody really got a free ride. You know? Yep. Yeah, so. Yeah. So was that your biggest show? Yeah. Uh, the Dennis Alexia show was probably the biggest show. Yeah. Show, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, a, we had another one where, when Stan fought Masaki Sataki in, um, 
in uh, I think that was the entertainment center as well. That was a pretty big show. That was nearly a sellout also. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, Stan and uh, not, and Tarsus, I, I we heard that they were always mashed up to fight or Sam Sam and Stan. How come that never really eventuated? Well, we, we actually did promote yeah. Tarsus and Stan. Yep. Uh, that was at the Palace. Yep. Uh, that was early on in our in our um, uh, in our promoting in my promoting career and early on in their fight careers. Yep. Uh, Tosca beat Tars, uh, Tosca beat Stan that night. Yep. Decisively. Good fight. Look, it was uh, it was uh, it was uh, Tosca was really on top of him for the first couple of rounds. Yep. Uh, Stan came back a little bit, but um, then Tosca caught him with a spinning back kick, yep. and he caught him really, really well. Uh, yep. Lower abdomen, definitely not a low kick. Yep. Um, and Stan didn't continue after that. Yep. And I think the points were were tallied uh, uh, at that point, and 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 Tosca was way ahead. Yep. Uh, and he won the fight really, really well. He won it decisively. It was a great show. Yep. The yep. Palace, yeah, the Palace nightclub in St Kilda. The Palace, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, out of all the venues that you did, what was the venue that you enjoyed working at the most? Um. Well, one show stands out a lot to me. Um, it was a good show, but it was also a bad show from the perspective that a lot of our fight, my fighters, actually got hurt. Yep. Um. Uh, it was at Dallas Books Hall. Yep. And- We had three guys rush to hospital that night. And that was a that was a bad experience from the from, from a perspective of boys getting hurt. Yep. So I really didn't like that. So that stood out. Yep. Um, but um, look, every, every show had its own, I suppose, idiosyncrasy. They all had some highlights and some lowlights. Yep. Um, and I enjoyed them all. You know, for me, it was just I, I love the sport. I, yep. I, I really love being with the fighters. I mean, they're all my friends. Yep. And um, I really. You know, it felt good to be part of um, their, their their careers and, and, to, help and yeah, to help them. I traveled the world yep. with some of them and, uh, you know, it was a great experience. I loved it. Yeah. Would you say that's your passion? That was your passion? It was my passion back then. Oh, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah, I really loved it. Yep. Yeah, I, I really loved it. I mean, I love watching the, the, the UFC fights now. I love the MMA. I think that's that's the ultimate form of fighting. And I think if I was still in the game, I think I'd probably be promoting that uh, yep. or doing something involved with, with MMA. Yep. Uh, but... Um, you know, I think the sports really come to uh, uh, great maturity now. Yep. And uh, you know, uh, for, for me, kickboxing was always a great sport, and when it sort of eventually uh, grew into Muay Thai, yep. uh, uh, it transcended into Muay Thai. I, I think it it was really more, uh, I suppose, a more well-rounded form of fighting rather yep. than just boxing. Yep. Um, but I think now the MMA stuff, I think, is great. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Yep. Um, so, who's your favorite MMA fighter at the moment? My favorite MMA fighter. Well, uh, it's um, well. That's a great question. There's a couple, but um, I forget his name. The Russian boy that beat uh, the Irish boy. <laughs> uh, What's his name again? Khabib. Yeah, Khabib. Khabib. Yeah, Khabib. Yeah. I, I, look, I, I think he's that kid's an animal. I, yeah. I, I think he's just so tenacious. Yep. So convicted in the yep. way that he uh, approaches his uh, uh, the sport. So I mean, I, I love him. He's, he's a very tough boy and. I think he's probably one of my favourites. Uh, I have a venue in in, in Saigon, and I was uh, I had the pleasure of uh, hosting uh, Rich Franklin. Yep. Uh, he, he's got a gym in uh, in Saigon. Okay. Yep. And uh, I've made a couple of friends there, and I trained at their their gym. Yep. Uh, Walter and Rich, and uh, so uh, I, I I love Rich Franklin. I think he was a great ambassador for the sport. He was a yep. legend, absolute legend. Um, you know, and, um, and there's a few other guys, I suppose, that I like, but. Uh, yeah, I, I love the UFC. I love the UFC. I, I think I love what they do. I think they do a great job. Yep. Mm. So, so why did you end up stopping? Why did you stop promoting? Um, <laughs> Aside from the fact there was thirty-seven, you know, <laughs> thirty-seven out of the forty that didn't make money, but why? Why did you stop something that you're so passionate about? Um, I, I think my customer. I, I was in the fashion business, yep. and and my, my business was growing uh, at the same time. My fashion business was growing at the same time. I think my customers had a really hard time really relating to me as a blood sport promoter and a fashion designer (laughs) and they couldn't see somebody like that having two hats like that yep and uh i think when when uh in the 90s that's when cable tv was um supposed to get going yep and it didn't because of a problem that they had with the way that they bid for the licenses yep so it was shelved for five years yep and i think i had to make a choice there because i was spending a lot of time and energy and money on, on the sport yep 
and I thought it's going to be a while since I get any return on something like that financially. Yes. And my business did require me to sort of be a little bit more focused on that side because yep. it was becoming a very serious business because I had about 30 fashion stores at the time too. Yep. So I made the decision to 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 opt out. And, and look, uh, um, Tarek Solik uh, picked up the, the 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 I suppose where I left off, and he did a great job. He yep. he, uh, he he continued uh, to promote the sport, and he loved it as well. Yep. And uh, you know, he was initially uh, a promoter of of the Turkish boys, and and yep. and there was some really great fighters uh, uh, that that he had. Yep. Uh, Jalal Ilhan, uh, Gherkin, of course, yep. Prince Amir. He had some really good boys uh, uh, that, that were fighting under him, and um, and he did a great job. Yep. He, he continued, and he did a great job. So, so it was great. I felt I felt really good because the sport continued at, at, at a certain level. Yep. And I had a, I had a good feeling that I mean, for me, it was a it was a feeling of accomplishment, and I'd taken it to a certain point with, yep. with the guys. gave the, gave the boys a great opportunity to to improve on their skills and and get exposure to to the global community of of, of the kickboxing fight game which was yep. great so uh, it was left in good hands so um, you know he did a great job and and you know there's so many great events that are happening now i mean there's so many promoters johnny sheeta still does a little yep. bit i think yeah um Brian quite, Trude, i think he's Brian yeah, Trude, yeah Brian yeah. is doing a great job yep. yeah with uh, what he's doing over at uh, his venue yep it's fantastic i think the sports really uh, moved moved yep. ahead so it's great yep mm. I, in, in the media you often hear about um a lot of the negative aspects of our sport and of, mm. of our combat sports. My, my, my perspective is, you know, like combat sports does many more positive things than it does negative things Absolutely. for our society. You know, Absolutely. It's quite a, it can be quite a redemptive um, a thing for people to be able to transform their lives. Mm. I mean, what's, what's your opinion on, you know, things they talk about like organized crime and all that sort of stuff being involved when see any, of, any of that sort of thing, you know, no. it, it, it's, you know, look, uh, it, it's, it's obviously not, not a nice thing to taint a sport with with maybe criminal elements in the community. Yeah. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, the sport doesn't doesn't I suppose turn people to criminals. It doesn't do that at all. In, in actual fact, I think it, it allows uh, certain people in the community that may you know have a tough or rough upbringing that want to be in a, a sport of, of fighting. It channels their energy and the, and it disciplines them to 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 allow themselves to express themselves in in the sport. So I think it's I think that's not right at all. Yep. Uh, I think there's uh, those elements, those underworld elements everywhere. Uh, yeah. It's in it's it's in the corporate world just as much as it is in the in the in the fight scene. So uh, I think at the end of the day, you can't really blame a, a category of sports or or, or a, you know some a discipline like uh, martial arts yep. directly related to 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 crime. I think that's quite unfair. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I totally agree. With yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It, it's yeah, it's it's unfortunate that it's sort of that way. I mean, that's mm. one of the things that we like to sort of help change mm. with, with what we do here as well. Yeah, you know, of course, like we have people at our gym, like Cam, for example. He uh, he used to you know get into fights and all that sort of stuff when he was a lot younger. And now he's you know he fought and won a few titles, and now he's done his masters in strength and conditioning. So you know he's he's completely changed his changed himself and transformed. Yeah. And I think there's many many more stories like that that happen in, in our industry that just get completely lost and forgotten of course i totally agree with that because these boys they come in or girls or whatever they are and they come in and they they take on uh you know this this physical sport uh, which is a, co a contact sport and uh, they get trained by by coaches who are obviously at a much higher level than what they could be so so they they're getting disciplined from somebody that they may slightly fear on a physical level yep. uh you know, they, they, they may be out of line in, 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 in a normal school environment or in the street yep. and get away with that, but they potentially don't get away with that sort of thing here. So yep. I think being able to to accept some form of discipline allows them to be disciplined in other areas of their life as well. So I can see that people can make a change yep. in themselves by, you know, by pursuing a, a sport or a hobby or whatever it may be for them where it allows themselves to be disciplined from the physical side, from the physical HAN. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a positive, of course, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So um, tell us if you did you have any fights? I think I had one fight. Oh, yeah. Who was that against? <laughs> that was against my uh, fellow promoter, Compasalis. Yeah. Yeah. And we fought for charity. Yep. And uh, and I'm glad to say that I won the fight <laughs> under the heavyweight division. But I was smart enough to. Uh, I should say smart enough. I was actually smart enough for myself <laughs> to retire straight after that. Yep. Yep. Was it a boxing fight or a kickboxing fight? It was fight? a kickboxing fight. Yep. Yeah, we held it at the Metro Nightclub. Yep. Yeah. And we had a 
pretty good crowd there. So it was in front of witnesses. We were, <laughs> yeah. we were wearing pants and it was a kicks above the waist. Or no, 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 no. It was just ankle supports and it was uh, it was a multi fight. Yep. Okay, multi fight. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I do remember catching him with a left hook in the second round and dropping him, <laughs> even though he claims it was a slip. <laughs> <laughs> so who trained you for that one, Paul? Paul, Paul and Tosca. Yeah, ah, Paul, okay. Paul and Tosca in my corner. Yep. And uh, so it was great to have them in my corner. I bet they. And uh, it was really funny. I actually trained really, really hard for the fight, and uh, and and my 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 sparring and training was actually quite good. Yep. Um, but I did notice that, uh, and I was fairly fit. I was actually really, really fit. I was yep. fit to do six rounds. I think we only did three, but um, yep. but I actually was out of breath in the second round purely from nerves. Yep. From just from nervous energy, you yep. know, just because I, I mean, we would do ten rounds at sparring in uh, in the gym and i did it with no no no, no issue whatsoever yeah but uh, nervous energy so so i could see that you know the first two or three fights in a fighter's career would be you know would be difficult yeah uh, you know fighting in front of people you know it's uh, fighting on stage a stage fight basically yep. but uh i enjoyed it it was great it yep. was, we, we we donated i think seven or ten thousand dollars to charity That's awesome. uh, i think it was to the make a wish foundation yep and uh so it was great it was yep. fantastic yeah yep. so what do you think makes a good fighter um, I think that there's a number of things, but, uh, I, I think the, um, firstly, they, they, they have to be disciplined yep. and they have to have the conviction to, to be a fighter and want to be a fighter. Yep. And, um, uh, they have to be tenacious and they have to have that never die spirit. Yep. I, I think I've had, I've had a lot of fighters that I, that I promoted and the ones for me that really succeeded, uh, or wanted to succeed yep. were the ones that had those qualities. Yep. Um, Terence Ocasio had the quality. Yep. Tosca Petrides had the quality. Yep. Uh, Darren Hitchcock had the quality. Yep. You know, there's quite a few fighters that had that quality. And, you know, Stan had that quality as well. But uh, he, um, you know, he, he look. Stan was a great fighter, and he and, and he did a lot of good for the sport. But I don't think he fought to the best of his abilities. Yep. You know, yeah, I, I think he he left a little bit outside the ring. You know. Yep. Um, whereas the fighters I mentioned left everything in the ring. You well, know? Why do you think that was the case for Stan? No, oh, Stan, sorry. I think he had the wrong. I mean, I, you know, again, Dana Goodson, you know, a lovely guy, and yep. and uh, he's done with the piss. He was a great man, and a lot of respect for Dana. But um, uh, and sorry, I shouldn't actually even uh, say it's Dana's fault. I think Stan was the problem. Stan, Stan, even though he accepted discipline, he 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 refuted it at the same time. So he didn't allow anybody to really tell him what to do. Okay, uh, it was Stan's way. Yeah. You know, so, and I love Stan. And yep. I hope he's watching the podcast. <laughs> yep. uh, but that's my honest opinion. How was that to manage, though? Like, if you're promoting him, how was that to manage? I, 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 I had a difficult time uh, promoting Stan. Yep. And we unfortunately had a fallout uh, because of that. Yep. Um, and he went his way, and it's, you know, good luck to Stan for that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, the fight game is 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 a, is a discipline, yep. a, a, and you have to be disciplined to, to be able to uh, – really reach the heights that you want to reach, you know, if you want to reach those heights. And it's not just from a promoter or manager level, it's from your, 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 your fellow sparring partners, from your trainers, you know, from all, from a wide variety, but you've got to be a disciplined person uh, yep. and, and got to be totally respectful as well. Yep. Cause I think when you have those qualities then there's a lot of people that would get behind you and support you, you know? Yep. Mm. So out of all, so who would you say is the best trainer that you've seen? The best trainer? Yeah. You don't have to say Paul, because yeah, of course I know. Look, no, no. For me, I think yeah. it is Paul. Yeah. Because uh, uh, not that I trained under Paul as well, but I, I obviously trained with Paul, and yep. and he trained a lot of the fighters that I promoted. Yep. But um, he's 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 probably one of the best trainers, a all, all round the trainer mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, I think Dave Hitchcock is also a great trainer. Yep. He's, he he, you know, I haven't seen Dave for a long time, but uh, he's one that really did it for the sport he loved the sport like yep. paul did and, yep. and and both these men they did it for the love of the sport yep. and uh and and really wanted uh you know they wanted to see their boys excel yep so i would say paul and dave are probably so, the best so trainers out there what made paul such a good trainer in your eyes and also um, dave too yeah um they were two different styles yep paul was a very very calm and very very um uh what, what's the word he really knew how to get into the psyche of the fighter yep. and and get the fighter to make himself or herself realize what they needed to do yep you know um 
So he was very calm and collected in the corner always because uh, I, I had the I was fortunate to travel with Paul uh, uh, to Japan and to Canada and to America. Yep. So I was able to see him firsthand because I was in the corner with him. Yep. Uh, so I was able to see him firsthand handle the fighters. Yep. And uh, I, he really got the best out of the fighters that way. Yep. And he didn't. Re- he never really uh, screamed on the side of the ring. He he always spoke very very. His tone was always constant, but he trained the fighters to listen out to his voice. Yep. And they followed his commands really, really well, you yep. know. Dave was a little bit different. Dave was more of a very passionate coach. Yep. And uh, he was very passionate and he really got – he drove his fighters from a motivational perspective. He really motivated them on a passionate level. Yep. Because um, I remember he got a lot out of Darren like that, you know, and yep. Darren became a top fighter like that, you know. Yep. But Dave – also trained Sam Solomon, who was yep. a great fighter. Um, Frank Laziano was also a great fighter. Yep. Um, you, uh, you Dave, you know, trained, and Dave was a fighter himself. Yes. Uh, uh, and he was a very successful fighter himself. So, yeah, I suppose those guys. Look, Dana Goodson also, I think, was a great coach, but I think Dana didn't, was, wasn't as disciplined with his fighters, I don't think. Yep. Mm, mm. Yep. Yeah. So what was the best fight you ever saw that oh, wow. you promoted, but, and, and in general? Oh, the best fight I ever saw. <sighs> I think one of the best fights I ever saw was um oh, there's so many. Oh, my God. I guess top three if you like. I'm really calling on my memory here. <laughs> uh, boxing fight, I think, was uh Tosca against Iron Barkley. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that one. Do you have footage of that? Do you know that's a great question? Because if you do, we would love to have that footage. I'd love to put it on uh, on our Facebook yeah. page and, or on YouTube if you've got it. You know, one of the very unfortunate things that happened with me was uh, when um, uh, I, I, there was a fire in one of my warehouses mm-hmm. and I lost all my tapes, oh. all my master tapes in that fire. Yeah. And I cried like a baby when I lost those because that, um, that was my life yeah. in, in the kickboxing world. And I actually turned to people like Tony Takazio and Tosca to get copies of tapes because I never had them. I, I mean, that were more, oh, my, all my master tapes were there. Oh. And I cried like a baby when I lost my tapes. I mean, I, you know, I lost everything, but you cannot ensure that sort of thing for money. No. I mean, that's that's invaluable. Yeah, you know? that's right. And um, I lost everything. In my, in my, in, it was uh, such a sad thing for me that, that yeah. happened back then. But um, I'm sure somebody must have that, that tape. Yeah. You know, so one of the boys must have that tape. But another great fight I remember was Stephen Vick against um, – he fought on the Dexplodin Selexia card against a Mexican fighter. Yep. I forget his name now. He, he, but that was a phenomenal fight. That was a toe-to-toe fight Yeah. for for, 12, for 10 rounds. Yep. A phenomenal fight. Um, another fight was, was a really good fight. I mean, Darren Hitchcock's fights were all wars. I mean, yep. he, he had some phenomenal fights as well. Oh, it's hard. You, you know, you've called up my memory now, and unfortunately, uh, I, oh, look, another great fight, I've got to say, is Tosca Patrice against John Terrio. Yep. Yeah, that was a phenomenal fight. Yeah. Were they just standing toe-to-toe as well? Yeah, well, Tosca actually nearly stopped Terrio, I think, in the second round in, yep. in Montreal, Canada, but uh, and then he went the distance. Oh, was this the one when, when he, okay, okay, I remember this one. Did Paul talk about that one? Yeah. This was when they were grooming John Terrio to yep. fight Rick Rufus for the world title. Yep. And Tosca was supposed to be a warm-up fight. Yeah. And I'll never forget that night for as long as I live. Yep. Uh, we were, uh, you know, Tosca only had the Greeks of Montreal supporting him. There was like 7,000 people in this venue. Yep. 100 Greeks. Right? <laughs> and um, when Tosca caught his Ifterio, I think he was the second round, if I'm not mistaken. And he got him for a standing, oh, no, not a standing count. He actually dropped him and he got up and he was a, a count on him. And the bell literally saved Ifterio uh, uh, yep. uh, in that round. And then the fight went the distance. Yep. And I turned to Paul and I said, "Mate, I said there is no way we're going to win this fight, no yep. matter what. I mean, we, we, he, he, he's definitely ahead on points. Definitely yep. won the fight on points. But you know, they're grooming this fight for this massive fight. You yep. know, this guy for this massive fight. We're in their hometown. We got the decision that night, mate. Yep. And I was like, oh my god, I was <laughs> like in heaven. Yeah. You know, I, I jumped for joy. I remember Tosca actually knocking me over because I was <laughs> <jumping around. laughs> My son actually claims that I, 
I, I, I thanked the, uh, the commentator, the promoter, and I said to him, I'm, I'm glad to come back to the States whenever you want to invite us. We're in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I was so excited. I didn't know what I was saying. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was a phenomenal fight. Yeah, that was a real so phenomenal. did Tusker get to fight the guy that uh, – no, no, unfortunately. Yeah, it was uh, quite disappointing that the uh, promoter didn't even pass on the belt. I mean, and that Tosca actually won the belt because if Ter Johnny Terrier was the title holder yep. at that time. And uh, it was for the world title, and uh, we yep. didn't get the kudos for it, which is very sad. But um, yeah, uh, it was uh, it was a great night. So, in terms of in those sorts of situations, when really, I mean, Tasha should have the right to fight the guy. Yeah. What 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 would you how how could you negotiate it better, or what could you do to be able to get that sort of thing happening? Because it sounds like there's a lot of politics in in the sport. Yeah. Because there's so many different federations and so many different. Yeah. You know, if I remember correctly, that was an ISKA fight, yep. ISK sanctioned fight. And it really is the unfortunate downfall of the ISK organization because they just did not have the balls or, or, or the power to be able to dictate to the fighters what should happen. Yep. They were unfortunately being dictated by the fighters, dictated ah. to by the fighters. Yeah. Yep. So Rick Rufus and Johnny Serio were quite obviously they were legends of the sport and mm -hmm. quite powerful fighters from their from their stature. And um, I think they dictated the terms to ISKA, whereas it should have been the other way around. Yep. I mean, I'd like to see fighters tell Dana, Dana White what to do. Yeah. And he'll kick them out of the organization, you know, yep. who he wouldn't care who they are. Yep. And and I think that's great. Yep. Um, I mean, the p fighters really should not be able to dictate terms if they're not, if they're not worthy at the yep. end of the day. So, um, so Tosca definitely should have had the title and definitely should have fought Rick Rufus for for sorry for for the challenge uh yep. if Rick Rufus wanted to challenge for the title it should have been Tosca yep so yeah Tosca unfortunately got the raw end of the stick and us as or uh, myself as his manager this is, you know unfortunately it's not in my hands yep. because it's with the organization that that controls the, the belt yep yeah so that was unfortunate what were the main um organizations then it was the ISKA uh the WKA yep and um Wow, what else was it? I think it was just basically two. I promoted always under the WKA. Yep. And um, and then it was just the ISKA was just the other organization. Yep. What was the WKA like to deal with? They were fine. That was basically controlled by Bob Jones. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. Yeah, because it was his organization. Yep. But it was world recognized. Yep. And, uh, and he had affiliations all over the world. Yep. So in actual fact, it was like a UFC, basically. I mean, yep. we were self-controlled, uh, but we were fairly fair. I mean, when, when a fighter had a title and he had to make a defense, he made a defense. Yep. And uh, if he didn't make the defense, then we vacated the title. Yep. You know, so we were, I mean, Bob actually saw to that and he was very, very, very fair guy when he came to that sort of stuff. So yep. he never showed any favoritism. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about Bob. Hmm. Well, I got, I got to tell you, Bob was a great man. I mean, he's a great man. He's still alive. Yep. Uh, yep. I, I learned a lot of Bob. He, he was, uh, for me, one of uh, he was a great entrepreneur, yep. uh, definitely ahead of his time. Yep, uh, I think he really uh, uh, he really progressed, and, and he really showed a a very very interesting form of karate uh, uh, to the world, and he and, and he brought that to to, to I mean he he evolved in Australia, and, and he really made a successful business out of that. Yep. So uh, full respect to him. I learned a lot from him. Yep. And it was great. I remember. You know, going to the Hombu on a Saturday, where and he'd be there, and I'd spend four hours speaking to him, you yep. know, just talking to him about the sport and just getting ideas from him, and and he helped me a lot. You know, he he was a mentor to me in yep. many ways, and I got a lot of respect for Bob. You still in touch with him? Unfortunately, no, uh, yep. I, I'm I'm not. Uh, I live in Vietnam. I think he lives. I'm not sure where he lives at the moment. I think he lives in Spain or something. Mm, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I actually uh, uh, recently have befriended his his daughter yep. on Facebook, yep. and uh, and I follow a lot uh, about what because uh, she's been promoting uh, okay. the Bob Jones brand and the Zendikai brand, and I've been following a lot of that stuff, and they've shown a lot of the old pictures yep. uh, on, on the site, so it's sort of it's quite nice to see all that stuff, yep. um, and uh, sees a lot of I see a lot of old pictures with Bob and a lot of the stuff that he used to do. I used to love um the um the events that he'd stage yep. especially for uh, i went for my second degree black belt yep. uh with with the guy and uh that was a great experience he had the um the octagon where he had all everybody in um in uh in uniform you know surrounding him and it was it was a great ritual paying respect to 
back then it was Kyoshi. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it was it was actually a really, really interesting sort of uh, process that he had, the tradition. So what was the, what was the process, August Rock? Um, everybody was in samurai uniform yep. and swords. And uh, we all were pointed in towards Bob. Yep. And um, it was like his hierarchy, hierarchical system and he'd have his yakuza or his is uh i'm sorry unfortunately i've forgotten all the terms all the japanese terms yeah. that he had for every section yep and everybody was wearing different colors uh according to what they bring to 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 his uh organization yep and so would, what would that like an example of that is what so when if i was to if what did you bring to the organization for example that's a good question i remember the color that i was wearing was uh uh what color was I wearing? Wow, that's a great question. Was it the photo that we put up recently? I think you were in red. It red? Could have been red. Right. Could have been red. Yep. Um, uh, and there was three of us wearing red. We had our samurai swords. Yep. And uh, yeah, because he's got them all in different colors. Yep. And they represent something different. Yep. And uh, it was quite an interesting ritual. Yep. Yeah. I'm sure that's been filmed and I'm sure that would be something great for you to actually show yeah. on the podcast. That's yeah, really interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Great to see something and like then that. you broke out and then we had the, the grading. Uh, yep. We had to do 200 push-ups and 200 sit-ups to start to warm up. Yep. And uh, now then, I know where Paul gets it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've got to tell you a funny story. The, yeah. the first time I ever met Paul Pfeiffer. Yep. Uh, I remember going up to the Hombu gym. I was actually joining uh, Zen Dukai back then. I see this guy on the mats, just doing push-ups continuously. And I turned to this guy and I said, well, he's doing push-ups for a long time. He said, he's doing a thousand. I said, what? 1,000 push-ups? Yeah. He said, he will do 1,000 push-ups. Yeah. And I'm watching him and I said, this guy's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I think he did a thousand push-ups. He, he did it like for about 15 minutes. He was just doing push-ups. So, so did he have any breaks? He was just banging them out? I think he did a couple of, a couple of small breaks, but he just went on and on and on. I think Paul... Back then, it was all about quantity and everything. <laughs> if he did a roundhouse kick, he'd have to do like a hundred of them. <laughs> yep. I suppose that's what gave him the form that he has. I mean, well, he's perfect form. Oh, <laughs> he absolutely. He does. absolutely. <laughs> I remember actually watching Paul um, maybe a few years ago. So he's, he would have been in his 50s. Mm. And um, this guy came to spa at Daniel America. Maybe it was a bit longer. Anyway, he came to spa at Daniel America. And this guy was going to spa, uh, going for a title. And so because Daniel wasn't there, Paul said, oh, I'll, I'll jump in jumps in, does a spinning back kick and drops this guy in the first round who's fighting for a title, right? <laughs> and the best part, and he in, the best part about it, after he dropped him, the next few rounds, he was just working with him and chatting to him about, you know, nah, you, you know, just chatting, chatting him through the next few rounds and this guy's about to fight for a title and Paul drops him with a spinning back heel. Well, let me first tell you round. something. For Paul to do that, yeah. for Paul to do that, this guy obviously did or said something wrong because <laughs> let me tell you, knowing Paul the way that I know him, Yep. He would have wanted to help the guy through, go through his movements and all that sort of stuff. I think he wanted to teach him a little lesson. I'm sure. And then, so I'm sure, I'm sure there's sure, more yeah. to it than that. No, no, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but it was, it was just, it was amazing to see that mm. someone who, you know, this kid's, you know, about the peak of what he's doing. Yeah. But then he can just come along and do that and still be able to land it and time it so perfectly. Oh, yeah. Well. No, I, I, it's because of all the thousands of, thousands of. Absolutely. You know. No, I, I've sure. seen him do it on a number of occasions. Yeah. With all of his fighters. Yep. Yeah, so uh, when they step out of line, yep, he steps in the ring. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember uh, sort of when Tony was sparring. Oh and, yes, uh, yeah, could, could, were you there? Yeah, I was there. Okay, tell us, tell us what happened. Tony was sparring a number of guys. Yep, but uh, I think Paul had had enough when he was sparring Zed Zachariah. Yep, and uh, and Paul, just, sorry, Tony just wouldn't stop. Yep, he, uh, Paul would just just get easy, mate. Take a step back, just you know, it's a it's it's a sparring session. Mm. Tony only knows one gear, and that's full throttle yeah right so he kept doing and i think paul had a frustrating day with, with, with him that day so paul said jump out of the rings in so he jumps in the ring <laughs> and all i can tell you was i remember tony tokazio's expression on his face when he finished and it was this <laughs> so so i think paul just said connected quite a few times yeah and he sort of showed tony that when he actually you know barks a command you should listen yes uh, and and uh, that's the look tony but you know not taking anything away. Oh, Tony, unfortunately, only knew one gear. Yep. A and I think whenever that bell rang, Tony just said to himself was, I'm fighting for my life, even <laughs> if it's a spa. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's all he knew. Yep, yep. Yeah. So tell us about your clothing brand that you uh, that you had for so many years. 
uh, Christopher Cronus. Yeah. I had yeah. uh, my brand for yeah for uh, about twenty years, twenty five years. Yep. Actually, you know, twenty five years in Australia. So yep. Really enjoyed that phase of my life. It was good fun. Yep. And uh, it did really really well. Yep. Uh, but I didn't unfortunately move with the times where you know I should have shifted all my uh, manufacturing operations offshore. I, I believed in Australian made. I, I wanted to make everything in Australia. Yep. And I had a good core of customers that supported that. Yep. But unfortunately, that didn't give me enough traction to sustain a, a realizable business. So yep. uh, I unfortunately, I had to cease operations. Yep, yep. yeah. Yep. Mm. And I remember Paul mentioned you had a, a, a perfume that you made. Yeah, lots so of fragrance yeah. under Christos. Yep. That went really, really well as well too. Yep. I'm proud to say that we were one of the top selling fragrances in Australia for a very long time. Awesome. So uh, yeah, it was. I've experienced a lot in that game, so uh, yep. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Yep. So now I'm a, a restaurant bar lounge owner in yep. Saigon. <laughs> yep. Okay. What's it called? It's called Madame Sal. Yep. Uh, and it's uh, it's in the heart of Saigon. Yep. Uh, on the 67th floor on, of the newest, actually the tallest building in Southeast Asia. Actually. Yep. Uh, the building's 88 levels high, yep. and uh, and uh, it's only just recently opened. Yep. So. Um, Anybody from Australia is welcome to join. Come, come, come and come and see me there. I'll definitely come here at the start yeah. of August. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, how, how do you find that business? What do you find challenging about the? Um, uh, uh, challenging from the uh, the fact that it's uh, uh, a Vietnamese landscape. It's yes. not Australia. Yep. So challenges there from a uh, from a communication, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, level. But the, I, I love Vietnam. Yep. It's it's a beautiful country. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there for the service industry. Yep. Uh, and I think for people like myself, uh, I have the ability to be able to, uh, to, to create IP that, you know, that, that obviously I've had experience in yep. and, um, and, and be one of the first people to do it because yep. it's, uh, it's very much a, a virgin territory from the, from that perspective. But, yep. um, it's a very entrepreneurial country. I mean, the, the people there are, are lovely. They're, they're beautiful. Yep. Um, uh, I work with all, all my employees of Vietnamese, of course. Yep. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, they're great. It, it's a great place and I love it. I've been there for four years. Yep. And uh, I see myself being there for at least another five, five or six years. Yep. So um, I'm really enjoying it there yep. at the moment. Yeah. So how did you end up going over there in the first place? Um, <clears throat> I sold a license there for uh the playboy trademarks yep. uh, uh many so, years ago in 2010. okay so the playboys in like uh, you have the merchant yeah, yeah, yep, yep. yeah. Yep. so uh i on the license there so so yep. uh, for the trademarks and we sold it for uh to to a fashion business there yep uh, in 2010 which obviously allowed me to 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 travel there on a regular basis yep and I just saw the landscape there I just you know the, the I could see that the the country was moving really really quickly yep and um, they've only just recently opened the doors for uh, ownership to expats. Yep. Uh, whereas uh, it was only re it's only recent that's happened. It was up until a couple of years ago, you had to have a local partner that that, that had the majority uh, share of the business. Yep. Uh, but now it's uh, fairly open. Uh, you can invest in the country, and they make it very um, attractive to invest in the country. Yep. And uh, look, I, as I said, for, for me, Vietnam is, is a country that's really moving ahead in leaps and bounds. Yep. Um, the people there, I find beautiful. Uh, yep. uh, you know, the government's great. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're really progressive for the country, and, and they really welcome uh, foreigners uh, yep. to, to invest and, and work there. You yep. know, so I'm really enjoying it. Really, really enjoying it. Yeah, mm. fantastic. So, how long are you back for? I'm back. Uh, I'm off in a couple of days. I, I came uh, obviously to see my beautiful boy my son and uh, my nephew's wedding yep uh but unfortunately it's a short trip but hopefully uh back soon again yeah. yep yeah awesome yeah mate thanks so much for coming on the podcast uh, thank you for inviting me uh love to love to uh, uh share some of my uh experiences it yeah. was uh, it was a great time in my life uh, uh the kickboxing world and the fight game i really enjoyed it if you had to tell one story from that whole period that would exemplify your time in that in that industry and in that period of your life what would it be oh my god best there's so many <laughs> I, know. I know that's why I, I, I want to hear something that we haven't heard or that many people wouldn't even have heard of because i reckon you'd have some pretty good nuggets of uh nuggets of stories oh my god i don't know if i could say this on on public television <laughs> yeah you'll be fine don't worry. i swear on this podcast all the time oh do you really well the two times i've been on it okay <laughs> um 
I've got to tell you one funny story, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, uh, Tosca had an opportunity to fight in Japan. Yep. Uh, the promoter's name was uh, Mr. Ishii. Yep. So the K, the guy who owned K1, yeah? He owned yep. K1. Yep. He owned K1, yeah. And uh, so we went up there and uh, Tosca 41 his fight. He yep. fought uh, Otakawa, I think his name was. Yep. And um, so the promoter treated us to a night of uh, uh, fun and debauchery. Yes. And uh, so we went to this to this club. Yep. Um, and uh, there were a lot of girls, obviously, at the club. So the promoter walks me in with with Paul and mm -hmm. and Tosca and some of the other boys, all the other fighters that fought that night, all the European fighters. And he said to me, Mr. Cronus, he said, all these girls, yep, you can have anyone you want. But this one here, her name was Rosemary. Yep. I'll never forget her name. Yep. Rosemary, yep. she's my girl. Yeah. So don't let any of your fighters or any of the boys go close. I said, no problem, Mr. Ishii. Yeah. That's fine. Who does Tosca go to? <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary. <laughs> I said, mate, that's the promoter's girl. Yeah. Do not talk to the promoter's girl. Yeah. Leave her alone. There's so many other girls here, mate. Yeah. He goes, but she's talking to me. I said, no, she's not. You're talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> I said, leave her alone, mate. Yeah. So anyway, Tosca being Tosca, yeah. does not listen, takes her home, right? Yeah. And he was asking me six months later, how come I haven't been invited back to Japan <laughs> to fight? <laughs> I said, are you fucking for real, mate? <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> Please, mate. <laughs> so I suppose, that, I mean, there's a lot of funny stories like that. But yeah. uh, but that's one day that uh, and Tosca, to this day, yeah. says it's not his fault. <laughs> she went to him. I said, I said okay. <laughs> After Mr. Ishii made it completely clear to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, he spent like, I mean, he, he, he paid for the whole night for all the guys. It was about $10,000. I'll never forget it. Yeah. It was a, the bill came to about ten grand. Yeah, and uh, Tosca decided to take the promoters' go on. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so not too many people have heard that one. Yep. Tosca will still deny it this day. I don't. I, 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 we'll call him later. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you have much to do with Sam? Sam Gregor? Yep. Yeah, I I remember promoting him uh, uh, in one of his early. He actually fought a, a, a Kyokushin fight on one of my shows. Yep. And. Um, and uh, he, he fought this guy from Queensland, yep. from Brisbane. And I remember he grabbing this guy in a clinch, grabbing his gear and pulling him close. And Sam's left knee comes up to the side, the, the, the right side of that guy's jaw, and he completely knocked him out cold. We thought we, he killed him. And I remember Kerry Packer being in the audience and yeah. James Packer and, yeah. and my good friend Graham Burke yeah. uh, from Village Road Show. Yeah. And they were just like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> Did he kill this guy? <laughs> And uh, and um, uh, that was uh, that early on in Stan's career. Yeah. Uh, Sam's career, Sam. sorry. Yep. Uh, but Sam had, had, had already started fighting in Japan at that time. Yep. But but he became a household name after that fight. I mean, because it was exposed everywhere. And, uh, yep. And, uh, I mean, Sam's a great fighter, a great man. Yep. Uh, I hope you get him better, Sa uh, Sam. He, he unfortunately just had a health scare just recently again. Yeah. Uh, but um, he's a great trainer now. He's got a great fighter that he's training yeah, at the Jimmy moment. Crute. Jimmy Crute. Yeah. He's doing a great job with him. Yep. Sam's a good friend of mine. I'm, I'm also the godfather to his wonderful daughter, yep. Jacinta. Uh, and, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's a great guy, Sam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We wish him all the best. He's, yeah, uh, all the best, Sam. Hope you yeah. get better, buddy. Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Bash. Let's, let's go to Squires and yes. have some steak. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, my mum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Richard's an alarm, except that's her ringtone. Oh, man. I don't hear that sound.